Okay, well, hello everyone and welcome to our In Dialogue series. This is a partnership between the Louisiana Children's Museum and the Tulane Institute of Infant and Early Childhood Mental Health. My name is Angie Bridenstine and I'm a faculty member with the Tulane Infant Institute and I'm happy to be introducing today's webinar. The team at the Louisiana Children's Museum is working every day to bring you new ways to interact with the topics that are most important to our community. And the topic of our webinar today is Beginning Again, Supporting Children as They Return to School. Our presenter today is Dr. Corey Black. Corey Black, PhD, is a postdoctoral fellow in psychology at the Tulane Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. Dr. Black provides clinical services to students and families at the Center for Resilience in New Orleans, Louisiana. He completed his doctoral training with Tulane University's school psychology program and has provided behavior intervention services and teacher consultation in childcare and grade school settings in New Orleans, Louisiana. So I want to let everyone know that this webinar is being recorded and it will be shared later on the museum YouTube channel. At the end of the session, when Dr. Black has finished presenting, we will open it up for a Q&A period. So if you have any questions throughout the presentation or at the end, please submit them using the Q&A button that you'll find at the bottom of your screen. And just to mention, if we suddenly disappear, it will be because of power issues due to thunderstorms, but right now it's quiet, so hopefully we won't have that problem. So again, thank you so much for joining us. And now I will turn things over to Dr. Black. Thanks a lot, Angie. I appreciate that. Um, and just to give a disclaimer and a warning, I am single parenting <laughs> at the moment, so uh, may hear some uh, some interruptions from my children. Uh, but uh, just wanted to give you that uh, disclaimer, and also to let you know that uh, we're going to be talking about supporting kids as they return to school. And I am right here with you as we try to figure it all out together. All right, uh, so the title of today's webinar is uh, Beginning Again, uh, Supporting Children as They Return to School. Uh, I'd like to begin by, sorry, I'm moving on some things on my screen, uh, by discussing our two main objectives. Uh, so the first objective is to explore the needs of children returning to school settings after extended absences due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and we also uh, want to introduce and discuss some strategies uh, to appropriately respond to the needs of our children who are returning to these school settings uh, in whichever uh, way uh, parents and caregivers see fit. All right, um, so this is just a, a roadmap to sort of outline what we'll talk about today. Uh, so we're going to start with thinking about uh, how we cope with different stressors in our lives, uh, followed by uh, how we think about discussing COVID-19 with children of different ages, um, get into uh, some things to think about as we prepare to return to school settings, uh, whether that be in person, virtual, or hybrid, uh, and also responding to children based on these returns uh, to these settings and questions that they may have or behavior responses that we may uh, see in them that we hadn't seen before. Uh, and lastly, think about next steps as caregivers or uh, professionals who work with families of children uh, returning to school uh, and how we can think about what we should do next to best support our children, but also to make sure that we are uh, keeping ourselves together physically and mentally. All right, so uh, coping strategies. So according to uh, the American Psychological Association, a coping strategy is defined as an action, a series of actions, or a thought process used in meeting a stressful or unpleasant situation or modifying one's reaction to such a situation. Um, and these coping strategies uh, tend to involve either conscious, tend to involve uh, conscious and direct approaches to problems uh, in contrast to defense mechanisms. So these are things that we uh, purposely do or actively do to try to reduce our uh, response to a stressful situation. Uh, sometimes these coping um, strategies can be positive and other times they can be detrimental. Uh, so we want to think about different ways in which children, but also uh, 
caregivers adapt to stressful situations. Right. So to start thinking about this, um, I want to uh, sort of follow the model of NASP, which is the National Association of School Psychologists, in how they think about coping styles. So while we're going to be talking about how these apply to children, uh, I encourage all of the caregivers and uh, professionals who work with them to think about how this might apply to adults too, uh, so we can best support ourselves uh, in supporting our children. Okay. So um, the name for this is uh, basic pH. Uh, so it includes uh, coping styles where you focus on beliefs, uh, another one you focus on affect, um, social, imagination, cognitive, and physiological, right? And we're gonna break down each one of these a little bit. Uh, so a belief is one's uh, belief system is used as a means of coping. So when we think about how uh, kids or adults who fall into this coping style uh, cope with stressful situations, um, it's usually um, uh, a kid or adult would turn to their belief system and rely upon the core values that they've acquired either through those around them or through the settings that they've been in. So for example, maybe uh, religious settings or different uh, family uh, traditions that may help them with how uh, they cope in certain situations. Uh, kids often uh, who use this coping style often seek meaning through religion or spirituality. Uh, and one thing that can help them is to have them around uh, like minded peers. So peers who also uh, use this coping style or who may share similar belief systems as they can one normalize uh, how kids are feeling or thinking about certain situations, but also can model um, ways that they cope using uh, this belief system. So caregivers can reinforce this coping strategy uh, by reaching out to faith community, uh, but also providing time for the kids, like I said, to spend with peers who have some similar beliefs, but also family members who uh, may be able to assist kids uh, in coping with this way. Okay. Uh, the next coping style is affect. So um, people who use affect coping style cope with situations through expressing emotions. Um, and um, let me add that not everybody uses one coping style. And also you may see uh, a variation in which coping style somebody picks to use depending one on the situation, but also depending on the setting uh, where they are, because that may influence what kind of support or what types of reinforcers they have to keep using that coping style. So uh, those who use affect uh, cope with situations through expressing emotions. Uh, one thing that really supports uh, kids who use this style is having their feelings validated by caregivers. Uh, I think a lot of times that we forget how important it is to actually validate somebody's experience, but also validate the feelings that they have. And this could be very small as much as just saying, uh, I get it. Like, you are feeling really anxious right now. You're feeling really sad and that's okay. That makes sense. Uh, I would feel anxious and sad in this situation too. And when we give kids that support, we'll let them know that they are okay in feeling how they feel. Uh, that gives them the permission, one, to talk about it, but also uh, to understand that those around them uh, may be feeling the same way. Um, and one, another way that uh, caregivers can support this is to model open and genuine expressions of feelings. So we can do this directly by providing specific spaces for our kids to talk about emotions, uh, but we can also do it indirectly uh, by making sure that we're talking about our emotions in a developmentally appropriate way. Okay. Uh, lastly, caregivers should remind kids of emotional availability. So letting them know that they are there for the kids to talk about things and also that it's okay to talk about emotions that we don't have to keep it inside or uh, button it up. Okay, the next uh, coping style is social. So uh, that means that uh, people who use this style seek support and control through the relationships that they have. Um, so to keep this coping style uh, going, uh, caregivers can help their kids increase connections uh, with those around them, and particularly uh, increasing connections through the roles that they have in family uh, and school settings. So what this does it, is it allows, there you go, sorry, I had to open up the juice. Um, it allows 
uh, kids to uh, restore emotional security. So again, knowing that they are safe uh, in settings with their feelings, but also help uh, give uh, them a sense of well-being that uh, is strengthened through the social connections that they have. And uh, caregivers uh, of kids who use this coping style are encouraged to provide opportunities to safely socialize. Uh, and I know in um, the times right now where we are dealing with uh, a global pandemic, that may be a little bit tricky, but one thing that we can think about is alternative ways for kids to socialize with their peers. Uh, so this could be through phones, through video chatting, uh, engagement where we're able to safely physical, physically distance. Uh, but again, just making sure that we allow them to have those social relationships and those that are developmentally appropriate. So considering the differences of age and the kids in your household and making sure they have those outlets with kids who are on their developmental level um, and trying to increase their time to uh, spend with those peers. Uh, imagination. So uh, kids who use this coping style use, use creativity to cope with stressful situations. And this may look different based on a kid's developmental level. Um, the way that it's laid out here uh, sort of breaks it down into three different areas. So early childhood, uh, sort of middle childhood, and um, then into adolescence. But depending on where a kid is developmentally or uh, just where they are and how they want to express, kids may fall into these different categories, uh, even if they don't uh, fall into them age-wise. So preschoolers may demonstrate creativity uh, through play. Uh, this is often seen when kids may experience some sort of stressful uh, incident. So for example, a kid using their toys to recreate a car accident that they may have either witnessed or been involved in. Um, kids in middle uh, childhood, so elementary, maybe early middle school, uh, may create fictitious stories. Uh, so one example of that may be a kid who uh, creates a story about their caregiver who went to war, returning home as a war hero. So again, this gives them a creative outlet to sort of start talking about a stressful situation. Uh, and it's important to not focus on how true or untrue the details of these stories are, but just to allow them to have that space to express how they feel and to get those conversations started. Uh, and older students or older children may use uh, dark humor to sort of deal with tragedy. So they may make uh, jokes about things that are uh, typically sad or kind of grim. Uh, but again, this is their way of, one, expressing their feelings about it, uh, but also starting to show your caregivers like, hey, this is something that's on my mind, something that's bothering me, so I kind of need to have it addressed, okay? Uh, so adults can support their kids by providing opportunities for them to uh, express themselves create, uh, creatively. Uh, so this can include art projects, essays, music, uh, whatever means um, that the kid can engage in uh, and also allows them to uh, express what they want to express uh, related to the stressful situations. All right. Uh, the next coping style is cognitive. So uh, those who use cognitive coping style have a problem solving approach to deal with stress. Uh, so kids, but also uh, adults who uh, use this approach may benefit from age appropriate honest dialogue uh, so these are um, those kids who have anxiety or may have worry about like uncertainty or like not having information effects. Uh, and not to say the caregivers will have all of the answers, but um, kids who use this COVID style benefit best from just having honest conversations, again, that are age appropriate, but that do give the information that they need uh, in a straightforward way. Uh, and um, I encourage caregivers to sort of find uh, literature that may support them. So one, it can help inform you of how to best uh, communicate information. So for example, uh, for COVID, um, using like the Louisiana Department of Health website to get facts or uh, Center for Disease Control uh, websites to get information, uh, but also depending on the age of the child, um, allowing uh, them to have uh, some time to explore uh, not those websites because we want to make sure we're monitoring, but uh, time to explore like some handouts or information that is uh, directly provided from professionals. 
Uh, and the last uh, coping style is physiological. So uh, through this style, coping is achieved by uh, through physical activity. Um, and there's a dual benefit of this coping style. One, it allows uh, buffer time. So this means that kids are able to have some space in between like the stress that they are experiencing uh, and talking about it. So it gives them something to engage in where they don't necessarily have to be thinking about it, but also don't have to necessarily express that to caregivers. Uh, but also it allows them to informally talk about it in a way that's not as direct or uh, focusing on specific things, but still allows them to uh, sort of explore how they're feeling. And my inclination is to ask if anybody has any questions right now, uh, uh, but I know this is a different type of presentation. So. Right. And we'll have time for uh, questions to be submitted uh, after we wrap up. Right. So uh, next I'd like to move on to talking about discussing uh, COVID-19 with children. Right. So uh, first recommendation is to monitor your behaviors and responses to COVID-19 related life changes. Um, and what I mean by this is to be aware of how you're responding. So uh, if you are feeling worried or anxious about a particular situation or uh, about engaging in certain activities, make sure that you are taking care of yourself so that you can model uh, the appropriate behavior and not uh, add extra burden to uh, your children uh, and how they think about it, uh, but also to be aware of the conversations that you have. And sometimes I know we think that when kids aren't around, they aren't necessarily listening, uh, but we want to make sure that we're mindful of how we speak to other adults, other caregivers about, uh, about COVID-19 because we don't want to add extra stress uh, to kids and we want to make sure that they are getting information in a developmentally uh, appropriate way. Uh, we also want to make sure that we have regular discussions about uh, what is referred to as social distancing, but I'd also like to, to think about it as more uh, physical distancing as we want to maintain uh, social relationships. Uh, one way to help kids understand uh, this method is to use visuals to uh, give them an idea of what uh, uh, six feet of distance looks like. Um, I know they have some handouts that use uh, fun things like alligators or like pots of gumbo, uh, but we want to just give them something to look at because when we think about younger kids, it's kind of hard for them to have like an abstract understanding of what things look like. Um, and it may uh, make it more real or concrete for them if they actually have something to look at and to uh, remember when we give them reminders uh, about social and physical distancing. Uh, um, when we think about uh, kids who are a little bit older or maybe able to understand, you can also talk about uh, flattening the curve and what uh, the efforts of social distancing uh, and wearing face masks, uh, what they hope to uh, gain. And also, again, with using the visuals, if you can show graphs of how uh, the curve is flattened and how we sort of reduce the number of cases that uh, have to be addressed by our medical teams. Um, and again, we're thinking about developmental, developmentally appropriate explanations. Uh, we want to think about that when we talk about symptoms too. Uh, and the Louisiana Department of Health website has some really good resources uh, that are pretty straightforward, but also uh, that are easy to share uh, with children of different ages. Um, and I think one of the biggest things is to limit or make sure we're monitoring the amount of exposure that kids have to news and to social media. Um, because one thing that we know is when there's an extended exposure to any sort of crisis, whether that be community violence, uh, global pandemic, uh, um, naturally occurring disasters, we increase our levels of stress and anxiety when we have a constant inundation of that information. So uh, not only do we want to make sure we limit or monitor the exposure that uh, our children have to it, we also want to make sure that we are maintaining the not maintaining, we wanna make sure that we're monitoring and limiting the exposure that we have to news and social media that focuses on um, COVID-19 and COVID-19 related life changes. All right. So preparing for the return to school. Um, 
these are some things that uh, we want to start thinking about and that we want to start uh, implementing, considering that uh, most kids have probably been out of school for about five or six months. Uh, and this is unlike any other break uh, that they typically have throughout the school year. So we want to make sure that we don't forget some of the basics uh, that we may have sort of become accustomed to or just fallen into uh, a habit of that play a huge role in how well our kids do in school settings. So one of those things is to establish a daily schedule and routine, uh, namely uh, eating, sleeping, and physical activity schedules. Um, the one that I would like us to focus on the most is the sleeping schedule. Uh, I know sometimes it gets easy to sort of just uh, let our kids like sleep the way they want to. So like going to sleep later, uh, waking up later. But when we start to think about returning to school, uh, whether that be a virtual, uh, in-person or hybrid setting, we wanna start getting their bodies uh, back to a place where um, they're able to function uh, as they were before when they were going to school. And a huge piece of that is a sleep schedule. Uh, so I encourage families to uh, start to think about and develop sleeping schedules for uh, their children and also include the kids in developing that schedule uh, so that they can have a part in it uh, and it helps engage them and you can explain to them uh, what it's for and how it uh, would benefit them once school uh, resumes. Um, another way to support our kids is to uh, have a regular review of the daily school schedule uh, and expectations. So uh, one thing about the schedule is to remind them of what a school schedule looks like, but also that that may look a lot different now, uh, considering uh, or depending on what school setting uh, caregivers choose. So that would be based on whether or not a kid is fully in person, fully virtual, or a combination of both. And it depends on the particular school setting and what that school has outlined uh, for its students and families. Uh, so reviewing this on a regular basis is uh, really important for kids. Uh, and this includes even once school starts, uh, especially when we're talking about younger kids, um, they may get into a school setting and sort of think that, okay, I've been here for a little while, I've been here for a couple of days, okay, now it's back to being at home, but reminding them uh, that know that this is the schedule. So uh, Monday through Friday or Monday through Wednesday, uh, these hours, and again, creating those visuals to help them have something to anchor uh, the things that you're saying. Um, but also it's important to review uh, behavior expectations or engagement expectations. And this is a place where caregivers are encouraged to reach out to schools and get information about this uh, because many of these things have changed and uh, will be ever changing. So uh, keeping uh, regular, keeping yourself regularly informed about what is expected of students, whether that be in virtual or in-person settings uh, and making sure to communicate uh, that to kids in, in a developmentally appropriate way. Um, lastly, uh, on this slide is to discuss new school procedures. So for those who would be in person, uh, lots of things will change, uh, considering like classroom sizes, uh, having to wear a mask, uh, physical distancing, uh, maybe different uh, school transportation protocols. Uh, but again, uh, I encourage parents to find out this information from their schools uh, and make sure to share it with uh, their children because when they are prepared uh, for this, these changes are prepared for entering the setting, it makes it a, a lot easier than if they were to go uh, and had all of this come at them at once, once they're back in their school setting. All right. Um, so uh, another way is to work with our kids on having safe peer interactions. Uh, and the big thing is to find alternatives for physical gestures of uh, caring. So a lot of times uh, kids like uh, to be physical with one another. So whether that be hugging, high-fiving, uh, playing games on the playground that involve uh, physical contact, we wanna make sure that we uh, don't only tell them where well, you have to have physical distance or you have to uh, be over here, but give them other ways to reach out and connect to their peers, even in a school setting. So maybe like having air high-fives or being able to uh, write letters, uh, but also 
just exploring with the kid to have them think about different ways because their uh, peers or teachers may have come up with ways to have them uh, socially engaged but still uh, physically distanced. Um, and for those who will be uh, performing more of their uh, school, uh, the school-based services uh, uh, virtually, making sure that we provide kids with a uh, space at home that's conducive to learning, uh, where they are able to like have a quiet workspace as much as possible uh, and a dedicated space that works for them so that they are able to understand, well, this is my school space. This is where I uh, am, am able to engage in my virtual learning. Um, and that they can have a separation of, okay, this is school time, and then now I'm uh, back at home, right? Um, and lastly, having regular communication with the school, uh, want to understand changes in procedures or just to have all the information you need uh, about uh, your kids function at the school, but also to have direct contact with teachers as they will be um, your most direct point to how kids are responding to these changes uh, and how they may be responding to returning to a school setting um, in a uh, school setting as we uh, are in the middle of a global pandemic. Um, and also I encourage caregivers or those who represent caregivers to make sure that they uh, are open with schools about their questions and concerns. So um, if you are worried about something or you have concern about your kid's safety or uh, concerns about virtual versus in-person instruction, uh, find ways to communicate this to the school on uh, a regular and direct basis. Uh, because again, we want to make sure that we're keeping our kids safe physically, but also that we uh, make sure to address uh, their mental uh, needs when it comes to uh, this complete change in how they function in educational settings. So uh, responding uh, to children. So again, we know that kids will uh, have uh, different reactions to all of these changes. Uh, and we want to make sure that we are here to support them because we are the biggest fan and we are the ones that fight for them the hardest. Uh, so you will be inundated with questions. Uh, so we have to think about the best way to support the questions that we receive uh, from our kids. So uh, first is to let uh, the questions guide your responses. So we don't we wanna make sure that we don't provide uh, more information that is necessary. So think about what your kids are worried about and let what they ask you or what they show you through the behavior uh, dictate how much information you give them or how you engage. Uh, and again, I wanna say educate yourself on school procedures. So uh, this is important so you know what can and cannot be done or what is and what isn't available to best support uh, your child in the school setting. Uh, be honest about uncertainty. So uh, we would love to be able to let our kids know that everything is okay and that we have all the answers, but we have to be honest about that because we don't want to set them up uh, for an even bigger fall uh, if what we said will happen or what we said won't happen um, actually um, comes about. Um, and this is a big one. So prepare to answer questions again and again. Um, I'm sure those of you who uh, either have young children or work with young children understand that kids will ask the same question uh, over and over, even when you've provided a clear answer. One, uh, this gives them reassurance uh, as they may have been doubtful, but also uh, it allows uh, them to have like the sense of safety that like, yes, this is the answer. This is what my caregiver uh, told me and that I can continue to uh, get the same answer time in and time out. Uh, and when we think about uh, kids' fear of contracting uh, COVID-19, uh, we just want to remind them of the safety precautions that are in place. So face masks, physical distancing, uh, hand washing, uh, and that you will always work to keep them safe. Like your main focus is to make sure that they are safe in all of their uh, settings, uh, especially school and home. All right, um, so these are some changes in behavior that you may want to uh, keep an eye out for. Um, so irritability due to changes in schedule. So uh, whether your child is returning to an all virtual or uh, some in-person or virtual schedule, uh, 
they may have irritability because it's a change in the schedule where they are uh, asked to uh, engage in academics if they haven't been actually engaging for a while or have to go to, hold on one second, baby, or go to uh, different settings that they hadn't been in so that there may be some behavioral changes uh, that we'll want to respond to uh, in a really supportive way. And this is where getting that schedule and getting that routine in order uh, sort of helps before school even starts. Uh, so you also may have some school refusal or difficulty with virtual instruction. Uh, one thing we want to do is make sure to uh, like remain calm and also just have one some generosity with your kids, but also with yourself, uh, because this will be natural. So uh, one some school refusal, like talking them through it, uh, reassuring them and also seeing what about it uh, makes them uh, uneasy. Uh, and also with the virtual instruction, uh, realizing that this is new for everybody involved. So whether that be the teachers, school administrators, but especially the kids. So we have to sort of like take it slow and understand that we can't have the same behavior expectations with virtual instruction that we have with in person uh, because of so many obvious differences. Right? Uh, and to respond, uh, the best way, sorry for the Legos in the background, uh, the best way to respond to these changes are uh, to prepare the child for the changes in the daily routine. So again, that's those regular conversations and actually uh, changing the schedule, uh, validating feelings. So making sure that we hear them and don't necessarily uh, shut out the feelings that they may be having. Uh, gently remind them of the expectations. So this happens when kids are in a baseline place or so when they're not excited or uh, not irritable. So remind them of what's expected so that there's not a guessing game. A lot of times we think that because uh, these are our kids or because they know what they're supposed to be doing that we don't have to remind them. Uh, but it's really crucial to remind them of uh, what is expected so uh, they know uh, what we really want them to do. Um, and lastly, uh, be patient. So please be very patient with your kids, but also be patient with yourself uh, because there's not a <laughs> handbook for figuring this out. Uh, before COVID, and it definitely isn't one figuring it out uh, as we um, try to address COVID. All right, uh, so some next steps. Uh, know your options. So check with your child's school uh, about what instruction may look like for them. So whether that's uh, they have to be in person, or uh, whether they can be in person in virtual, all virtual, but also how long uh, that lasts. So Will they be virtual for a certain amount of time and then expect it to be in person? Uh, but also what the attendance policy looks like. So if they're in virtual, what constitutes being engaged and being uh, marked present versus absent? Uh, and especially if your child receives uh, special education services, being in touch with uh, your school's uh, um, special education team to determine how they get their minutes uh, and how those services are gonna be provided as they are uh, still legally uh, legally mandated to provide special education services to kids uh, who um, are in school settings. Right? Uh, so decide what's best for you and for your family. Uh, and what I mean by this is when deciding so whether in person or virtual, uh, make sure that you do what works best one to maintain everyone's physical safety, but also just some moments on, okay, uh, but also making sure that you do what you have to do to maintain the mental health of your kids um, and also yourself. All right. Uh, and last thing is to please be kind to yourself. I know uh, as parents, a lot of times we get anxious and worried about whether or not we're doing the right or wrong thing. Uh, but as long as you're trying and asking questions and doing your best to figure things out, uh, you are doing your best. And even if we have some bumps in the road uh, with trying to support our kids in their return to school, know that like you always have a reset button. So you can always start over and re-engage um, and that you're not going to mess up to that point. So um, just do your best in having patience with yourself the same way that you would have patience with uh, your kids. Uh, so these are uh, some citations and articles where uh, some information was retrieved. Uh, and also here are some useful links uh, with um, other 
ways to engage and support kids uh, and some guidance that uh, is provided by other agencies um, and how to support kids uh, specifically related to school uh, and uh, COVID-19. And uh, there's a link for feedback survey. Uh, Dr. Bernstein, should I leave this up? Okay, I'll leave this up. Uh, and thank you all for allowing me to speak with you today. Thank you so much, Dr. Black. That was really useful information. Um, and as you just mentioned, I want to just point out the feedback survey. So if anyone um, has uh, a chance to go to that link or to, um, to type it in later and go to the link, it will give you an opportunity to give feedback about today's webinar, as well as give any ideas for topics that you would be interested in for future webinars. And I'm just going to leave a moment for anyone who wishes to put in a question in the question and answer. Um, thank you again for this really uh, valuable information. And um, personally, I really appreciated how you pointed out patients giving some generosity and kindness and patience for themselves and for kids, because as you said, there's no handbook for this. It's, we're all beginners <laughs> at this right now. And so it would be um, ridiculous for us to expect ourselves right to be able to master all of this and um yes so um one question that has come in um it was a great idea you mentioned the uh alternatives to physical gestures and telling kids you know other ways instead of maybe hugging their friends um so just wondering in addition to explaining those do you feel like it might be helpful like to role play um or have kids practice any of those ways of, of greeting other people, maybe with the parents? No, uh, definitely. I think it's a great idea to one, role play it at home, but also to help kids learn how to uh, code switch. So they may be able to give parents hugs or give family members hugs and high fives, but that when it's time to go to school, like a reminder from parents that, okay, well, remember we do this here, but now you're going to school. So uh, asking, so how do we say, hey, or how do we say I'm having fun or how do we say good job? And just again, with those behavior expectations and reminders, making sure, okay, I think they've reached their limit. Uh, <laughs> having those reminders uh, before they go into school settings so they have it fresh in their brain about uh, how we're supposed to do this here. And then when they get back home, okay, we can do it here now because kids are really smart and they do know how to understand like I can do this in this setting, but I can't do it in this setting, so. Right. Great. Well, thank you so much again for the advice. Thank you to your kids for um, letting us borrow you <laughs> for the last 45 minutes. Um, and if there aren't any other questions, I just want to remind everybody that a recording of this webinar will be on the Children's Museum YouTube channel. I put a link in the chat box um, and you also could find uh, a link to the to the YouTube channel on the museum website. So thank you everybody for joining today. And again, thank you, Dr. Black for sharing your, your thoughts. Thank you for having me, Dr. Bernstein.